So uh, I'll take an opportunity today to talk a little bit about uh, multiple point geostatistics as well as introduced by Alex and, and talk a little bit about future ideas. I think Alex uh, introduced the topic already nicely and I borrowed a very, very old slide of mine. Uh, I would call, uh, I would also call this field geostatistics with training images. As you know, uh, what we try to do is to use a training image, which as Alex explained is a container of patterns, uh, as a representation of spatial continuity instead of the variogram, which even today remains a very poorly understood tool in practice. In traditionally in geostatistics we have hard data, soft data, as you see here, and we generate multiple uh, realizations that reflect these patterns and are constrained to the data. What's also very important is an element of non-stationarity, is that these patterns can be modified, they can be modified globally, can be modified locally, uh, such that, for example, uh, these particular channel patterns vary in their thickness, in their orientation, and we cons can construct very complicated models at a uh, very uh, fast CPU time. Now, MPS is a method that I think should be qualified or quantified within other means of modeling. Uh, and I've, I've used this slide here, it's a quite general slide, that says at least in my field, uh, mostly in reservoir modeling, we're using anything from variogram techniques, the traditional geostatistics, to physics process-based models that are very accurate in terms of their physical representation, but this particular process model takes here a month of computing time. So there is something to be said about techniques that are fast, that are realistically representing geometries, and at the same time can condition to the data. So what are outstanding challenges? I see three main areas. The first area is the one that I will present today, simply because of lack of time, is what is this training image? Who creates it? Right? This has always been a confusion in the field. Uh, and secondly, the, the other challenges that are also remaining is, as Alex, I think, presented really nicely, MPS is really a field of computer science. It's not a field of statistics. And the advance has come through computer science algorithms, data structures, and methods uh, of pattern recognition and pattern reproduction. And I think this is where the future will go. And there's currently only one practical software that is also publicly available to do MPS, and that is SCHEPS. Also extending applications, and we'll see some more applications probably later in the session. So let's talk about the training image a little bit. It's very clear, it's become very clear over the last few years that further advance in this field is not going to come from things better algorithms alone. And I'm going to talk today only specific to the reservoir geosciences because just out of lack of time, is that even in the reservoir geosciences where this field has developed, there is still a, a, a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of what this training image really is, what purpose does it serve, and how it should be constructed. So I'll spend some time on that particular topic. So what is the real difficulty? The real difficulty is uh, that we have two fields of expertise. The first field is that, in the reservoir geosciences at least, there is a large population of petroleum geologists who do interpretation. And the big question is, how do we use this interpretation? How do we use this information? This is information is extremely valuable, but often does not make it its way into quantitative modeling. And I think this is for the reason here. The reason is that what geologists do is interpretation of genesis and process that has happened in the pa in, as a past deposition. The field of geostatistics is not meant to be like that. The field of geostatistics is to represent geometries, patterns that are there today. And there is a missing link there. How do we go from something that is an interpretation of process to something that is an interpretation of geometry? And secondly, any geostatistics works for practical applications. We're not just interested in science. We're interested in solving real practical engineering problems. So there are two challenges there. The first is actually a very fundamental question. It's probably a fundamental question to any geostatistics. That is, can geostatistics fill this gap? Some geologists say no. Some geologists say we have to go back to the process because the process is the only thing that is real. 
That may be true, but it may also not be practical. And if we can fill this gap with MPS, how would we do it? There have been contributions. And one really nice attempt, and I do encourage you to read this paper uh, by Andre Jung. Andre is now a postdoc at Stanford, but he was at the University of Tübingen with Thomas Eigner. And uh, Andre looked, he visited Stanford even before his postdoc, and he looked at about 3,000 papers of carbon geology, classified them into certain uh, ways of classification, and made a really nice database uh, that can be used for constructing training images. So this is certainly one way to go. So how does this work? So first of all, of course, in geology, we need to come up with an element of classification. So here we see various ways of classifying. They're classifying hierarchically. In carbonates, of course, we have to worry about the time of deposition. Then we have a very large basin-like system and zones. And then within those, we have smaller shapes, architectural elements, and particular fishes. So he analyzed those papers and created a SQL database system, right, where geologists can go in and say, for example, here we have time, depot system, zone, shape, data type. Can go in and say, a geologist can say, well, I, we are in this particular time period, we are on a shelf, and then maybe on the shelf, I don't know whether I'm open platform or slow. And this is very typical, evidently, of geological interpretation, is that it is uncertain, right? And multiple geological interpretation will eventually lead to multiple training images. And I think this is one of the nice contributions here. So given that, uh, pop up all the various uh, classifications or the, uh, the systems, for example, here in Australia, uh, evidently the reef here in Australia, the barrier reef, is one of them. And pop up as well uh, elements of uh, dimensions uh, as well as various other data types that are associated with this particular data set. And we may have for this, if you click on these various, we may have a number of these uh, systems in the worldwide and geologists can then borrow information from that, come up with some geometries. So overall, it, it kind of works like this, and this is a real reservoir. Is we have a real reservoir with wells. People look, uh, geologists look at cores, to look at seismic data, look at outcrop data, make their interpretation out of the database, then come geometries. We created an unconditional Boolean simulator uh, to generate various training images that can then vary per zone in the reservoir and we can create reservoir models. So I think this is currently one of the only really exhaustive studies that have been done on um, um, creating these databases specific to MPS, and I think it is quite useful. Nevertheless, there's some fundamental questions related to all this. I think one of the first questions is, when does MPS apply? When do we use multiple point shift statistics? This is not a given to me. It's not because we developed it at Stanford that everyone has to use it. I feel that there are other techniques, such as surface-based techniques and even process-based techniques, that could apply. When should we apply those? And when should we apply MPS? It's a very fundamental question. As geostatistician, we often use by default geostatistics, but it doesn't have to be. Other questions that are remaining is, uh, how well do these algorithms actually reproduce the things? Uh, for example, in this, how good is this? How do we have qualitative methods to judge this? So we started to question this. And we said, what are really standards to set? How can we re come up with standards, ideas that everyone can agree upon, and not just some synthetic cases uh, that are always open to interpretation? So we started to work on actual experiments, tank experiments, particular to sedimentary systems. And so we're working with Chris Pola of the University of Minnesota, who has made uh, several of these tank experiments. What is so nice about a tank experiment? A tank experiment is not a training image, but a tank experiment is a reflection of what the real world could look like, and therefore could be used as a sort of a, a playground for algorithms and comparison of techniques and how they would per, uh, essentially perform relative to these real, really uh, realistically looking system. So here's a tank experiment, and here you have a slice in this yellow lump. 
And if you zoom in, you definitely see the scour features and channel features uh, in there. And you can even extract this kind of data and uh, use them as reference cases. So would you apply MPS on this particular case? Or would you apply other techniques? Would you apply maybe surface-based technique, event-based techniques? Or would you just use variable-based techniques? Would they be good enough? These are fundamental questions that we start to address. So the tank experiment data, it may be very tempting to think, let's use it as a training image. But it is not. Because a tank experiment is not a real reservoir. A tank experiment is not a real reservoir analog even. So what we can do is use a tank experiment as an analog for algorithm testing. An analog, a playground, as I said, where various things can be compared because these things really look realistic. In that regard, as I said, looking further ahead, it, we're going to use these experiments or these standards to really define what technique works best in what particular geological depositional system. Right? You could say in distal systems, where everything is much deposition-oriented, we can probably use surface or even Boolean techniques. In proximal systems, where we have a lot of erosion energy, maybe variable techniques work the best. And it will also depend on other criteria, such as how much data you have, etc. Okay, a last slide. Specific to the algorithms, I do want to say one thing, is that the emphasis on the, in the development of the algorithms, right? if you look, for example, in these systems, they are evidently very non-stationary, is to look at algorithms that are non-stationary instead of stationary. Simply because in traditional geostatistics, and this is pretty much true for 99% of all geostatistics developed over the last 50 years, is that the stochastic model is generally decomposed into a non-stationary component and a stationary residual. And that doesn't work very well in reality. That has been my experience. And so for the algorithms, we're really working very hard in taking a training image like this, which has evidently no stationary features, and without any decomposition, try to recreate realizations that look like it. So in summary, most important questions for the future is really when do we apply this technique? We haven't really investigated that. Secondly, are the training images, and specific to the reservoir geosciences, improve our understanding of how geologists reason, how their understanding of process can be turned into geometry. And then pro probably a uh, more uh, important feature to the algorithms is how can we really compare and judge algorithms with each other. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Jeff. We have time for one question. I think your, your presentation was impressive. Thank, Thank you very much. But I disagree. Sure. <laughs> no, I disagree. I like disagreement. I disagree <laughs> only in one point. You say this is not a statistics. Um, in fact, it is not. But it is not now. This is a challenge for statisticians. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the answer to your questions in the conclusion should be statistics. Well, that, is your, that is your opinion. Yes, That is your opinion. I disagree with your opinion. Uh, first of all, because we have tried statistics. We have been uh, at a three-year project with mathematical statisticians trying to use marker random field mm -hmm. techniques. It did not work, period. It failed. It failed. Mm -hmm. but and I can I give you the email of the statistician to confirm that. Yes. <laughs> so maybe there's more challenge. And there was a presentation also by, uh, by Chalmaland, who, who agreed that these techniques in such complicated systems simply are either computationally too challenging or mathematically too challenging in terms of the parameterizations uh, becoming too overwhelming to be practical. That was the conclusion. Future. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.